Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, a podcast brought to you by SciStarter. I'm Bob Hershon, coming to you from SciStarter's virtual world headquarters. I'm joined by my co-host, Miss Louisiana Earth, Caroline Nickerson. Today, we're talking about climate change and what citizen scientists exactly like you can do to help scientists who are tackling this critically important issue. Hey, Bob. Hey, Caroline. So, climate change. Yes, climate change. Suri, change the subject right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it can be hard to talk about. It, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, in fact, there is a survey conducted by Yale, um, researchers at Yale, that found that 72% of Americans report that they believe in climate change, but only 35% are talking about it. So yeah, that includes us. Yeah. We're well, part not- of that 35%. <laughs> I mean, it's not surprising. Um, I can't really blame them because, I mean, who wants to talk about climate change at a social gathering? You know, hi, anomalously nice weather we're having today, huh? Too bad it won't last. You know, it's just a, it's a problem that just makes you feel helpless. You know, so why even bring it up? And yet we're not helpless. And I think it's really important that we have these conversations. I know. And and I also know you've been really fearless about the topic. You're leading webinars and events and just jumping in with both feet. So how do you bring this stuff up without people running for the hills? Well, showing up in a sash and a crown definitely helps. (laughs) Outside of what I do at SciStarter, I'm wrapping up my term as Miss Louisiana Earth, and I took on that role because I thought it would be the best way or a really good way to get people talking about the environment in a way that's fun. So it makes the topic accessible Mm -hmm. and achievable to come together to better understand, you know, the hyper local implications of climate change and other environmental factors. Yeah. And just I, I have to give a big shout out to my friend Max Colley at the Museum of Life and Science in Durham, North right. Carolina, for that line of hyper-local thinking. His citizen science outreach has really helped me understand this issue. Right, me too. No, I love his stuff. And and I also appreciate your focus on sort of keeping it, you know, hyper-local rather than trying to tackle it, you know, on an intimidating global scale. Exactly. So how you experience climate change might be completely different from how your friend across town does. Mm -hmm. And the best way to understand those impacts is through citizen science. So collecting or analyzing data to come to a conclusion about the world around us, about the environment and the implications that climate change might have for it. Uh We may not all agree about the best way to address climate change and environmental problems, but I think we can all agree that we can do citizen science together to understand the problem better. Okay, you know, that makes sense. But I don't think I can pull off the crown and sash thing. Well, first of all, never say never. (laughs) But getting attention with something fun can help bring in new audiences and bring them into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you can educate and inspire. Right. Uh, And make no mistake, these are life and death issues with ramifications for people's daily lives. But the fun comes from the togetherness of collaborating with each other to understand a problem. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I use my platform from the Miss Earth USA pageant and the scholarship I earned there to get people involved in different citizen science projects as a way of jumpstarting these conversations about resiliency, a stronger environment and a safer world for all of us. Right. And and that sounds great. I think what makes it hard for me is the fear that I'm going to be viewed as like that guy, you know, the person who lectures and criticizes everyone about what they're doing or not doing about climate change. Definitely. And that stereotype is all over pop culture and fear of being that person Mm -hmm. probably shuts down a whole lot of important conversations. In fact, our first guest, Dr. Kate Carter, is actually studying that whole issue, how climate change is depicted in scripted media, like in sitcoms and movies. Let's get started with some introductions. Sure. My name is Kate Carter. I'm the Director of Community Science Education at the National Center for Science Education, and my project is Climate Change in Scripted Media. Um, And this is a project where we look at trends and patterns in the way that climate change is portrayed in movies, TV, and we even now have a few podcasts. Um, So we're interested in, in the ways that people frame issues around climate change because we know 
that the framing of issues is really important for how people react to them. Wow. That's so recursive. So this very podcast could be um, part of the data for this project on how climate science is portrayed in media. Yes. And then, <laughs> yes, we found the we found the infinite loop. I can just keep going on podcasts and then reporting those podcasts. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, how, so what do people do to help? How do they join and uh, and provide you with information? So really, all you have to do is watch media. So if you come across a YouTube video, if you're watching TV, if you're watching a movie and somebody talks about climate change in an interesting way, then we just ask that you report it. Um, so it's really simple to participate and you're really helping us develop some really interesting theories about how climate change portrayal has changed over time. And, and do you guide people towards certain things or it's just whatever they happen to watch or hear? We're really interested in, and this is a little bit, you know, subjective, but we're really interested in media that takes a perspective on climate change. Mm -hmm. So if you're like watching Law and Order and someone comes in and they're like, you know, there's a climate crisis in India, but there's also, you know, a, you know, a nuclear bomb and somewhere else and you have to choose what's more important. And then it doesn't really give us the important, wow, that's a great setup. It doesn't really give us the important information for how did that media frame climate change? So anything that takes a, a perspective is what we're really looking for. So what are some examples of media that takes a perspective that I could be looking for that I might encounter in my daily life? Um, one of the trends that, you know, as a climate change organization, we're really thinking about how do we counter this message is what we call the obnoxious environmentalist trope. Um, and that's where you have the person, and this is a really common thing, especially in sitcoms, it tends to predominate from about 2004 to about 2012. But I'm going to be honest, the season two of The Politician on Netflix had characters of this trope throughout. So what does the obnoxious environmentalist trope look like? Well, it's a guy who, normally a guy, sometimes a woman, um, but who gets really involved in environmental action. And no matter how good the main character is, the main character's actions are never enough to please this guy. Um, and so, you know, if they're recycling, this person is saying, well, you know, recycling does all these things and here's what I do instead. Um, and so why we're worried about this trope is because it basically convinces people that no amount of action will ever have anything um, that will never will never help. And so, what a lot of what we see a lot of uh, the main character at the end of the episode often resolves this by just being like, "Eh, what I'm doing is okay. Um, like I'm doing enough; it's fine." So it basically suggests that the people watching don't need to take action, don't need to be concerned and everything is fine. And while we know that individuals are not the largest contributor to you know, some of the impending climate disasters, we do know that individuals should be concerned and should be taking action. Mm. So um, the number one question I get at SciStarter is what if I do something wrong while I ruin the research? Um, I know with media, things can be subject to interpretation. So maybe one person perceives a climate message in a network drama as being really flattering towards climate change, where another person sees it as being neutral or not taking a perspective. How do you handle like people who might be nervous about their own interpretations about the media when they submit the data? Yeah, that's a great question. And the good news is um, everything that's submitted, we watch. We go on and find that episode or find that film and we watch the, the relevant clip. So it, you're, you're fine. You're totally fine. We also understand that it is somewhat subjective and we do take on, you know, there is a space where you can talk about why you think it fits the criteria and we definitely read those and take those into account. 
Yeah, and I was wondering, so is it just United States television, or would you be interested in, like, a Bollywood drama feedback or things like that? Or does it have to be English language, I guess, is the question. Um, it, English language is preferred, but we are well past the point where we're only consuming media from one country. Um, and so anything that you would normally come across is completely fine. We unfortunately don't have the linguistic capabilities to watch things in other languages. So we are, we are restricting it to English language, but anything in, the, in global media in English is great. The data you've analyzed so far, what are your preliminary results? I'm just super curious. The most interesting thing is looking at how it's changed over time. Um, even from about 1990, which was, you know, 30 years ago, we've kind of gone through different trends in how we talk about climate change in media. Um, one of my favorite examples is in the 90s, there was a time where we just kind of talked about, we talked about it like climate change is good. Like the textbook example is some people sunbathing on a roof in November and they're like, oh, this is so amazing. If this is global warming, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, but the, the, the new trend, and the one that I'm honestly really worried about is a lot of how we talk about climate change now has become really nihilistic. And it's something that is not really, I mean, in some ways I understand, but if we want to help people feel confident in taking action, help people feel empowered, this constant barrage of messages that there's nothing you can do, it's all going to go badly, it's really not effective. And it, it nihilism, has really become the predominant message that we've seen since about 2016, 2017. Um, and it's a really worrying message. So, but this project has been really useful because we're using the messages to figure out what messages we can use to combat it. So it's really helping us understand how we can develop better messaging to counteract what's what people might be seeing on their favorite TV show. I was wondering, Kate, how long the project will be running? So how long you invite people to participate for? Um, we're going to keep it open um, until the end of the year. So through December, the end of December um, 2021. And is there a minimum amount of um, effort to contribute just to let people know, well, if you join up, you're going to have to do this or, hey, you can just do it in a few minutes and that's it. Yeah. So if you're interested in joining, um, you can read about the project. But every time you watch something, you just fill out a form. It takes about 30 seconds to 45 seconds to fill out. And you can fill it out as many times um, as you watch something. So as you're going through your day, you hear something or see something that might fit, you can add it in. So it doesn't take a lot. Um, you can contribute one time. You can contribute a hundred times. Um, we're fine with whatever. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. It was nice speaking with you. Yeah. Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Wow. Who knew you could be a climate change researcher by watching movies and TV shows? That's what I call field work. <laughs> 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 Observing right. and monitoring and tagging things, even if it's media, is a broad and really important category of citizen science that helps scientists do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Scientists like Dr. Kate Carter. Mm -hmm. There's another project on SciStarter that involves SDGs, our Sustainable Development Goals. Oh, yeah, right. From the United Nations, the global goals that make it possible for everyone on Earth to lead healthy, productive lives. Things like um, access to clean water and sanitation. Let's see, that is SDG number six. And sustainable cities and communities. That's SDG number 11. And the OSDG project is all about gathering input from as many people as possible about how they understand those goals, including the ones you just mentioned, and how they think the goals apply to different real world projects and discussions. And with OSDG's new SciStarter collaboration, you can also search citizen science projects on the project finder by SDG. So if you want to address the global goal of good health and well-being, 
there's a citizen science project for that. Great. Well, let's bring in Dr. Lucas Pukelis and Gusta Stadilevichuta to help us understand the goals of the OSDG project and learn how we can help. Cool. Well, I think we'll dive in. Um, maybe could you both introduce yourselves? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Lucas Pukelis. I work as a lead data scientist in the Public Policy and Management Institute in Vilnius. And also, I'm one of the core developers of OSDG. Okay, and uh, hi everyone, my name is Gusta Sotolevich uh, I'm also Lucas's colleague at the Public Policy and Management Institute in Vilnius. Uh, I work as a product lead, and uh, we also work together on the OSDG project, so my primary uh, responsibilities are to take care of the, the volunteers and the citizen science project that we're working on and that we're going to be covering today, I think. Awesome. And um, walk me through the process of participating. So I am a citizen scientist. Um, how do I get started with your project start to finish? Maybe, uh, Gusta, do you want to take that one? Uh, basically, so what you do is you sign up for the platform. And um, we really uh, try to introduce the SDGs. Uh, from the very beginning, we hold workshops for the volunteers. We have some instructional material. And uh, once they're ready, they can proceed to the exercise. and. Uh, you get a short snippet of text, so it's like three to five sentences. You read it through, and uh, for each text, we ask a question. If, do you think this text relates to a specific SDG? So, for example, we could show a text on, say, I don't know, Australian weather and how it changed over the years, if it affected biodiversity, if it affected some kind of species. And then we're going to be asking, you know, do you think this text relates to uh, SDG number 13, which is the Climate Action SDG? and uh, then the person can uh, assess if this text corresponds to the SDG or not. Ah, and where does the text come from? Mm -hmm. uh, text actually comes from very diverse and relatively large number of sources. I think it's important to say that these labels that are assigned by volunteers, they will be used eventually to develop machine learning models. And uh, one of the needs of these models is uh, to have a very diverse pool of text. So I think we started off using UN documents, like we, uh, the documents from international organizations where this language is very clear and we added on additional academic publications, uh, documents from other organizations, and we will proceed to diversify this pool of text, even more adding news items, uh, event descriptions, and uh, things like that. In terms of the mission, so in terms of um, relating text to different SDGs, why do you think volunteers feel motivated to do that? I think one of the reasons why it is so important is the need to make your voice heard and maybe bring your own perspective into things. Uh, one of the key drivers for us in developing this project was to um, bring the SDGs out of the academia and uh, also to make them maybe a bit more democratic. Uh, so for someone who does not know what SDGs are, I mean, they are very clear and very intuitive. Uh, I mean, SDG 6 relates to clean water. So ensuring that everybody on earth has access to clean water and sanitation, or SDG 3 is uh, related to good health and uh, well-being, aimed at eliminating the most prevalent diseases and current health problems. But at the same time, uh, uh, these can also have very nuanced meanings depending from which vantage point you look. Uh, like if you are living in Europe or in North America, you look at things like good health and well-being. You think about, I don't know, cardiovascular diseases, preventing, uh, you know, obesity or ensuring that people can live healthier and longer lives. Whereas if you look at from, I don't know, somewhere the southern hemisphere, you might look at a very different sort of a range of health problems. You might be more interested in infectious diseases or maybe uh, some other things like malnutrition and so on. So in short, it's very important uh, that you know these different perspectives to what these SDGs mean, they are represented. And uh, people with you know different backgrounds and different needs can uh, help to contribute to that, to bring their own unique perspective into things. And uh, you know, make sure that you know these artificial intelligence tools, which when uh, 
in the future help the mainstream SDGs more, make SDG related content more visible, would take their perspective into account. Hmm. And, and Gusta, if you were explaining to a friend or relative why it's important for them to participate, what would you say? Um, I would say that the project has uh, a very clear purpose and uh, you're contributing basically to this uh, global movement, uh, global understanding of, of the goals. We're kind of paving the way for the future and uh, basically you are not only contributing to the movement, but uh, your work would directly contribute to other people's research and uh, new insight, new discoveries. So I think that's a reason enough to, to join. And um, really quickly to, to pivot a little bit, because I, I think you all have done such a wonderful job and now I feel motivated to get on your platform and start classifying some text. Tell us a little bit more about the new tool you built for SciStarter um, and how people can view it on SciStarter. So now somebody uploads a project description, it goes through a OSG text classification tool. And when uh, the tool evaluates if this project is SDG relevant, and if so, to which SDGs it is relevant to, and then returns that label, which users can then basically see on SkyStarter platform. And uh, if I can comment on that a bit more, so uh, aside from this uh, metadata tag that you see in project descriptions, members of SciStarter might also see the project filter. So you can find and filter science projects. You enter, for example, SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation. Uh, you immediately filter out projects that uh, relate to water monitoring, tracking river streams and some kind of um, chemical levels in groundwater, water clarity. So it's, uh, it's all, it becomes very, very simple to find your uh, thematic areas and uh, find projects that relate to them. I think this is the time to ask this question. I've been saving it. Um, what are, so we know now that SciStarter users can search um, for citizen science projects by SDG to make exam uh, a difference in their area of choice. What are your favorite SDGs? I, I, I know I know this is horrible that I'm making you pick, but what SDGs really resonate with your heart? And you can't say all of them. Pick a favorite. I'll make Lucas go first. Okay. I mean, um, yeah, I'm viewing this at... Uh maybe a slightly different angle. I worked on the developing initial text classifier. And for me, at the same time, my favorite ones and also my arch nemesis are the ones which are really hard to delineate. For instance, SDG 6 and SDG 14. So SDG 6 is clean water sanitation and SDG 14 is life underwater. So one uh, deals more with access to clean drinking water and healthy water. Another one deals with marine life and uh, also biodiversity in oceans and rivers and lakes and uh, stuff like that. However, at the same time, we have many overlaps because we both deal with water. So themes like uh, no plastic pollution or water contamination are present in both of these SDGs, which makes it very hard to sometimes they decide which is which. So, yeah, navigating this tight space between them is really interesting, I mean, for me academically and as a researcher. Yes, for me, it would be SDG3, um, good health and well-being. Just as Lucas mentioned, because of uh, how different our perception of health and well-being can, can be, you know, depending on where we live and what kind of health issues we see around us. So I think I would just go with SDG3. Awesome. Is there anything you both haven't told us yet that you think the listeners should know about your project and how they can participate? I think we can just maybe highlight uh, a few things that are coming in the, in the coming future. So we're very close to launching our kind of a community channel for everyone to exchange ideas, to exchange their progress on contributing to SDGs. And uh, we're looking forward to also um, creating a platform for these volunteers to share their uh, written content, you know, videos, and uh, uh, anything else that they deem, you know, relevant sharing. Mm, great. Thank you again to you both. It was awesome talking to you today, and I can't wait to participate in your project. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. So one of the things that distinguishes climate from weather is its timeline. You know, weather refers to conditions happening at a given time, while climate covers long-term trends and averages. And that means monitoring climate requires data stretching over many years, centuries, even millennia. 
Right. And since we didn't have global monitoring networks centuries ago, scientists looked toward other kinds of data, like tree rings, glacier core samples, and even historical records to understand how things have changed over time. Which brings us to our next guest, Dr. Lyndon Ashcroft, who runs a project called Climate Australia. Volunteers examine and transcribe historical documents from the 1800s with a focus on descriptions of weather. My name is Linda Nashcroft, and I'm a historical climatologist. Wow. So historical climatologist, um, what do you do on a daily basis? Well, I work at the University of Melbourne, and so in university life, every day is different, right? But when I'm, yes. when I'm researching, I am looking at the climate of the past. So in the Southern Hemisphere, we have weather observations that go back into maybe the 1950s, the 1940s, some parts of Australia back to the 1900s. And these can tell us a lot about what has happened in the past 100 years. But to really get to the detailed understanding of changes between droughts and wet conditions and understand how extreme weather events are changing, we really need to know a longer period. We really need to understand what happened over a longer period of time. And so as a historical climatologist, that's what I'm trying to do. I try to hunt down historical weather observations, information about our weather and our climate before official observations began to see what they can tell us about what happened in the past so we can prepare for what's going to happen in the future. Interesting. And what sorts of resources do you have to sort of, you know, to reenact this history? There are lots of resources around, more than you would expect, actually. There are lots of documents, not only weather observations. So we've got uh, numbers that people recorded back in the, in the 1800s in Australia. In the Northern Hemisphere, there are observations that go back even further and further in time, back to the 1500s in places in Italy. So we have these, these weather observations that were taken not by professional scientists, but by farmers or by astronomers or by priests or explorers or, you know, interested members of the community. So we can use those and then we can also use documentary information. So written accounts of what happened when a particular storm went through or how a community survived a heat wave or uh, what a drought is looking like in a, in a country town. These kinds of things people write about all the time, just like today. Everybody, everybody's always talking about the weather, you know. And in this project that we're doing now, we're using um, mainly numerical information, so mainly numbers, but also some written words that are accompanying those numbers. So we can kind of piece all that information together to rebuild the, the weather maps of the past. Your field is so cool. Um, and I, I think Bob and I are, came across to so the same question came to our minds at the same time. How does citizen science work into all this? You know, could you give us maybe a, a history of the project? Citizen science is such a key part of weather rescue and climate data rescue because, you know, we've got all of these pages and pages, boxes and boxes, millions upon millions of weather observations that we keep finding all the time. You know, some of them aren't even that old. They've just been taken by someone and they've been put in a box. And, you know, the organisations who are in charge of those boxes don't have the resources uh, to, to type those numbers up to put them in a format that would be useful for modern science. That's where citizen science really comes in. We, um, we've just finished a, a project here in Australia that's been looking at weather observations in Western Australia, in, in Perth, which is in the southwestern part of Western Australia. Australia. Uh, and in that instance, we had pages of all sorts of weather observations, temperature records, wind records, uh, remarks. Someone would say it was gloomy today. It was overcast, gloriously sunny, nasty frost, all of these kinds of things. And so we, there was a, a short, um, a short set of instructions explaining how to, to digitize these values and so all this this information and you would work through about two weeks worth of data so you would be able to watch oh this day it was warmer this day it was cooler these kinds of things uh, another one of our projects that we ran last year 
was looking at a beautiful set of observations from the 1840s and 1850s in Adelaide, which is in the southern part of Australia. And these observations, you should have seen this handwriting. It was like, it was beautiful, incredible cursive. And these, the person who was making these observations, we don't know who it was, they made lots of notes about what was going on in the community at the time. There was one day when an explorer set out to uh, look at the interior of Australia. Not much was known about it at that time. And everybody took the day off. So there were no weather records on that day because everybody wanted to see Charles Sturt off on his big expedition. You know, so this is the kind of information that we find. And, and in these projects, we ask people, you know, to, to look at the numbers and to type those into a box, but also to explore this wider history that comes with these weather observations. Great. And the sorts of people that do this and are interested in it, you don't necessarily have to be that into meteorology or science per se. It's citizen science, but you could be a history buff or nautical history or any, anything like that. And it would still be interesting to you. Absolutely. And that's what we've found. I think as with most citizen science projects, the majority of the work is done by a smaller group of people who are really interested in it. And other projects of this type in the past, we found people love working on this if they have a local connection, if they're from the area that the weather observations are from, or if they've got a family connection. You know, some there was a project a few years ago where somebody said, oh, my ancestor was on the ship. So I really wanted to experience the, the weather that my ancestor did when they came out to Australia, you know. We get a range. We get a range of people and students as well. I've had a fair bit of interest from students who, who kind of like connecting these things, connecting, oh, right, oh, look at these weather observations. Why are they important? We need to understand the past so we can get a good handle of what's changing and so we can be more accurate about future projections about our weather and our climate. And this is a really simple way for me to contribute meaningfully to climate change research. I get a lot of students enjoying that aspect of the work. And so I know with your Climate History Australia project, you all um, have finished up the initial process uh, with people digitizing the records. What have you all found so far? Any, any cool discoveries with that particular investigation? So many cool dis discoveries, Caroline. We're going to be working on these observations for years and years. It's so exciting. We, we've got about We've got nearly 68,000 weather observations now that we didn't have before that we can explore, thanks to nearly 1,800 volunteers who helped us rescue these observations in the last year or so. But yeah, now we've got these two slices of weather data, one from Perth and one from Adelaide, and both of these data sets act as a gap join, a gap filling data set. So for the Adelaide records, they go from 1843 to 1856 and they connect some really old stuff with uh, some more modern stuff. And Perth is the same. We have some really old weather observations that start in 1830 for Perth, which is, for Australia, that, that's really early in our colonial history, not our Indigenous his history. Our Indigenous history is much, much longer. But for the written record, uh, this is some of our earliest, our earliest weather data. And the observations that we have rescued now allow us to build continuous observation data sets for over 160, 170 years, which is really exciting. The work that we've done so far is around assessing the data for quality. The volunteers have done a really great job in, in rescuing the data and the citizen science work that's been done. People have been really on top of checking, oh, I'm not sure what this means. I, I, can somebody quality control this for me? People have been really diligent, which has been great. Uh, but now we kind of need to do some statistical analysis to make sure that the data are, are good. And our early results suggest that, yes, they are. We have also started to find some extreme events, heat waves and storms uh, and, and frosts and snowfall events as well that are supported by documentary information. So we're cross-referencing these data with newspaper accounts at the time and they're all kind of matching up really well, which is great. So the next step is for us to pull together all this information and see if we can look at a long-term history of storms in the area, of heat waves in the area, that kind of stuff. We've already done a little bit of work like this in other using other data sets that have suggested, unsurprisingly, we're getting an increase in heat waves and hot events and a decrease in snow events. But these new data sets that we've recovered are really going to 
fill a gap that is missing in this in in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere's climate record. We don't have much down here in the southern latitudes. So all the records that we recover are good for us as a nation and good for hemis- the hemisphere, which in turn improves global climate data sets. This is awesome stuff. Um, so thank you so much for telling us about what's going on with the Adelaide data and the Perth data. And, you know, I know you all are all busy analyzing your research team, what the citizen scientists have unearthed. But um, if people wanted to stay up to date with what you're discovering, ha- what's the best way for them to do that? This work is done as part of Climate History Australia, so I would encourage you to check us out. You can sign up to our newsletter. We send out regular blogs and updates, and we're working busily on some really interesting case studies where we're pulling out interesting periods from the data and and looking at the extreme events that have happened. So Climate History Australia on all the socials as well. And there are lots of other data rescue projects happening around the world. So I would also keep an eye out on SciStarter because I'm sure it won't be too long before somebody's unearthed another box of observations that really need to be rescued before they're lost forever. Definitely. And for your work in particular for Climate History Australia, do you think you'll have any other rescue projects up on Zooniverse in the near future? Or do you all kind of have your hands full with everything that folks have digitized already? As with most citizen science projects, I'm sure you know, we're quite a small team. So at the moment, our focus is on these two data sets that people have worked so diligently on. We want to make sure that we um, treat them with care and and honour all the work that people have contributed. But we always are finding records. And as we this project grows, more people are contacting us saying, I found my grandfather's records or I've got this box. Is it of interest to you? And they always are. So there are always small volunteer opportunities available and yeah you can get in touch with us via the climate history australia website if you're interested in those awesome yeah thanks so much i hope there's something in there that was awesome you know even our thousands of sci starter volunteers can't be everywhere luckily this year we had trillions of six-legged helpers to provide finer grain data observations Periodical cicadas, which emerge every 17 or 13 years, depending on the brood, can give scientists insight into climate change and a variety of other environmental factors in the eastern portion of the United States. This year, we had Brood X, aka Brood 10, one of the largest and most widespread emergences. Since the insects come out of their subterranean burrows when the evening ground temperature reaches 64 degrees, they act as fine-tuned temperature monitors. And chemical analysis of their bodies provides data on the presence of toxins in their local environment. Dr. Deanna Beasley at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga runs Urban Buzz, one of the several citizen science projects that took advantage of this summer's bug fest in the USA to study environmental issues. My name is Deanna Beasley. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Um, And I study insects primarily in urban environments and how they respond to environmental change. And uh, one of the insects that I study, I study variety, but um, I also study periodical cicadas and how they Mm. respond to Um, how they're responding to urban change. So what are they? I know people would make jokes like it's a new plague and stuff like that, but are they dangerous? I mean, what what is a cicada really? Okay, great question. So uh, cicadas are often confused with locusts, right? Because, you know, they kind of have that almost biblical presence when they appear. But in fact, cicadas and, and locusts come from a different order of insects. Um, Locusts are more related to your grasshoppers and your crickets, right? Cicadas come from an insect order um, called Hinitra, um, or true bugs, right? And so they're more related to like your aphids. Periodical cicadas, so there are a number of different um, species of cicada. What makes periodical cicadas so unique is that they have one of the longest life cycles and that they live underground for 13 or 17 years as in the case of brew 10 um and then they emerge you know in one (laughs) in in one big as one big group um to to sing and uh, meet other periodical cicadas and make more periodical cicadas and then they do it again for stay underground for the 17 years 
Mm -hmm. after their predators have all starved. Right. <laughs> or they're just like, I can't look at another cicada, right? Just yeah, too many, exactly. too many cicadas, right? And so that's the, you know, you know, that's what we believe is the, the strategy there in terms of coming out in mass is that you're just kind of overwhelming um, the predators in the environment. So you stand a better chance as an individual emerging as a group, you know, amongst your millions of other uh, periodical cicadas than if you were to come out alone or in smaller groups. Another thing is that we only find this particular group of cicadas in like the eastern and kind of midwestern part of the United States. So they're unique to this area. It's also one of the highly populated areas in the country. So we've been tracking them for years. Like we have records of periodical cicada emergencies going back to the 1700s. So. Um, so we have a very good record of, of when populations or broods were emerging and we can um, look at patterns of, you know, changes in temperature, changes in, in landscape, you know, structure and ground cover, for example, like there wasn't a city here, you know, or the city was smaller, it was a town, you know, and we can, you know, see how observations have changed over time as, um, as conditions changed. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And um, so I, I'm really fascinated that, that people actually send in the cicadas because so many of our citizen science things are, you know, you use an app and you record things and take a picture and 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 you just send in the data, right? You actually send in the critter. Yeah, you're sending in. <laughs> we're sending in the critter. I, I do remind folks. I do try to encourage folks to um, to be humane, right? So if you know some folks will choose to just to collect cicadas that have already died, um, and that's perfectly fine. And a lot of the questions that we ask, especially about body size, you know, we can we can use a deceased cicada. Um, we ask folks that, you know, just to be sure to put the cicada in the freezer for about 24 hours. That's just like a humane way of making sure that the cicada is actually, um, has actually passed and, you know, not to put a live cicada in the mail. That That's mm. not what we want folks to do. Uh-huh. But now brood, act, brood 10 rather is gone. So now what do you do? So now with brood, um, now the brood tin is gone. So it's it's now we're just trying to get to next steps in terms of what we want to do with the samples we receive. So the next steps would be just actually doing the lab work, actually seeing what can be done with these cicadas um, in terms of looking at um, the environmental toxicity. That this is a new area for me in terms of urban buzz. So I'm I'm excited to see what we can do um, and what we can learn. And then how about urban buzz itself? What can people, is, is there anything for people to do now, now that, that brood's over? Urban buzz is very much dependent upon emergences, right? So now that brood 10 is gone, urban buzz is kind of, you know, closed for now. Um, so what we, what I hope to do is, you know, once we get some direction in terms of what assessments we can make with these uh, cicadas, then hopefully we'll be able to publish that data and share that data with the public. Um, our last urban buzz study where we looked at urbanization effects on body size, um, we published that open access so that is available to the public um, where they can see our results from that study there. And we, we did see an interesting pattern there where we, we showed that the cicadas that we saw in urban areas appear to be larger than cicadas outside of the urban area in the northern part of the range. So, uh, so this was brood two. So this was um, a population that had one of the longest latitudinal range, ranging from North Carolina all the way up into New York. And it seemed like in the northern part of the range, the city was kind of giving uh, those cicadas a little bit of a boost in terms of they're able to get larger. Interesting. I would think the opposite because there's so much disruption. Right. And we, so we couldn't say like what was contributing to um, that factor um, or that pattern that we saw. And one just may be the urban heat island itself. You know, um, cicadas are insects or ectoderms. So that means that they rely on um, environmental conditions to, to thermoregulate, right? Um, so warmer conditions mean that you can stay active longer, you can develop longer, you can get larger in size potentially. 
Um, alternatively, we also, you know, we take care of the trees, we fertilize the trees, that sort of thing. So maybe we're giving them a nutrient boost. Um, it's it's unclear. So we, we weren't able to show, pinpoint exactly what's causing this pattern, but we were able to detect this pattern, um, which was really cool. That's really fascinating. And um, we pretty much went through all our questions. I just mainly wanted to ask if there's anything else that you'd want people to know about Urban Buzz that you haven't said yet. Um, you know, I, I always like to remind folks to stay curious and to, um, to keep making those observations. So, for example, I never imagined that I'll be looking at environmental toxicity in preocular cicadas, but that is just because the public expressed interest in learning more about the and learning more about it. And now I'm in a place where, you know, we could potentially look at that. So, um, so I appreciate Urban Buzz for folks willingness to share um, their ideas and their questions and you know I just try to do my best to, to follow up on that so I just want to express my thanks to folks for um, for keeping urban, urban Buzz going I mean it's very much like I said a, a public driven project at this point um, and I am just super grateful to all those local public scientists out there. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Well, the 2021 brood X cicadas are all dead, but their spirit lives on in the data that they're providing to Dr. Beasley and other researchers. Also, she's eager to work with citizen scientists again when the next brood emerges. Now, in the aptly named Ghosts of the Coast project, dead trees are also providing important climate change data. That's right. Ghost forests are stands of trees that have died because of an influx of seawater due to sea level rise. Our next guest is Sarah Noyes, who works with the Ghost of the Coast Project. Hey guys, my name is Sarah, um, and I'm a research assistant in the Gadan Lab, which is out of the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, and our lab studies um, coastal marine ecology of tidal wetlands um, and their responses to global change, more specifically those changes in sea level rise, um, invasive species and nutrient availability in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and the citizen science project that our lab has been developing um, in collaboration with Cora Baird at the Virginia Coast Reserve LTER um, is entitled Ghost of the Coast. Um, and the goal of this project is to engage citizen scientists to help document the formation of ghost forests on a larger scale, um, therefore expanding our knowledge of their formation locations and raising a greater awareness and understanding in this pace of coastal change driven by sea level rise. Wow. And what's a ghost forest? So ghost forests are these environments that we are seeing form um, as a result of increased sea level rise, um, flooding and saltwater intrusion, um, especially in our lab study area of um, the mid-Atlantic region um, of the eastern seaboard. Um, and so kind of what happens is as the sea levels are rising, marsh grasses are migrating upland into coastal forests um, and the forests are dying and they, they serve as these kind of really visual indicators of climate change and sea level rise. Um, you'll see these huge stands of bleached dead trees and again, those marsh grasses migrating into the forest understory. Huh. And, and if I'm interested now, because, because I've just been listening to this and now I'm intrigued, how do I get involved and, and help your research? Um, so we're, we are really excited in involving citizen scientists and helping to document ghost forest um, formation on a larger scale, because um, a lot of these environments that are changing in response to the sea level are really close to communities of people. Mm. Um, so we have created, um, a citizen science app entitled Ghost of the Coast, where um, we ask our users to record um, observations of locations in which they believe they're in a ghost forest. Um, and that then populates a public collaborative ghost forest map on our Ghost of the Coast website. Um, and we're really excited about what citizen scientists can add to kind of our knowledge of where ghost forests are forming, because right now we really only know where they are um, from where scientists have observed or seen them. Um, so we've already gotten some really interesting observations from our citizen scientists out there, and we're just excited to see it grow um, and raise that awareness in our pace of coastal change and also increase understanding. And, you know, when people see these ghost forests, they'll know what they are and, and why they're there. 
And are these ghost forests, are you only interested in people documenting the eastern U.S.? Or would you be interested in global observations? Where can people observe ghost forests? We are interested in observations from everywhere. Of course, we're seeing ghost forests forming um, at a higher rate in areas that are experiencing um, higher rates of sea level rise. So again, in that um, mid-Atlantic sea level rise hotspot that runs from North Carolina to Massachusetts, um, that's an area that we're seeing a lot of ghost forests. But um, we do kind of see ghost forests in in any area that's affected by tidal flux. You can see it kind of um, in freshwater rivers as well. Um, So really anywhere that is affected by sea level, but more in areas that have increased sea level rise. Mm. And and do you give a sort of a tutorial for people? So, you know, this is definitely a ghost forest. This is just some dead trees for some other reason. And, you know, and so that they, they give you the most useful data. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so on our Ghost of the Coast story map website that kind of houses our project and our collaborative map, we have a walkthrough of, you know, how a ghost forest forms and what it, what it would look like. Um, at the moment, we don't have a tutorial as part of our survey, but that is something that we're looking into developing, especially as we're reaching audiences wider than our local area. Yeah. And so what happens if someone sends something in that's not a ghost forest? Because I would say that's the number one thing the SciStarter community, our volunteers worry about. They're like, what if I do something wrong? Will I ruin the research? Uh, What would you tell those folks? Um, I would tell those folks that they're not going to ruin the research. We, you know, love participation and interaction with our, um, with our project. We have kind of a filtration system with the observations that we receive and the ones that will make it to our publicized, like public map on our website. Um, so there is kind of a check there. So we make sure that what we're displaying is in fact a ghost for us. And we're pretty easy to contact, like we have a lot of contact information on our website. So if people do have questions, we're more than happy to, you know, take a deeper look with that participant um, and and see what they're looking at and help them kind of learn how to identify um, and learn more about the environment that they're in. Great. Yeah. I mean, this is really amazing. So, so let's say that you reach all these volunteers um, and they document a bunch of ghost forests. What comes next after you have that research result, after you've mapped all these different ghost forests? So the basis of our survey is um, like the questions that we're asking people to upload and help us answer are based on three main research questions, which are where are ghost forests being observed? What do these locations have in common? um, And how fast are these environments changing? Um, so kind of with that data and with the photographs that we've been getting from our citizen scientists, we're hoping to just learn more about kind of the footprint of ghost forest formation and how widespread they are, um, and maybe even inspire some new research questions through kind of, you know, seeing the ghost forest through our citizen scientists' eyes, because, you know, we're constantly learning about our environments as well. So... How are you doing with volunteers? Do you need lots more? In, and is there a point where you have would have too many? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, I think at this point, we are really just hoping to get as much participation as possible. So again, we're, we are just trying to reach all different types of coastal audiences because we really want to, you know, increase a curiosity and connection in these landscapes that are so close to where people are going to school or working or living. Um, so we would love more volunteers always. Yeah. Great. Any, um, anything unusual or any anecdotes or surprises or anything so far? I know it's early, but, um, is there anything you want to share in, in that regard? Yeah, I think that, um, there's a portion of the survey that is directed towards participants that have known about the location that they're reporting about for longer than a year. So they can give us some more information about, how fast their environments are changing and what types of changes they've seen. Um, So we've gotten some really um, interesting and lengthy descriptions of how these specific points have changed through different storms over time, um, which has been really interesting to receive along with photographs. Um, So that's kind of giving us more of a historical context to some of these points, which is really cool. And we're hoping to get more of those. Hmm. Great. Is there anything else that you haven't told us yet that you think the listeners should know? I think that um, 
just, you know, in conclusion that ghost forests are a really striking visual reminder that sea level rise and climate change are not really, they're not hypothetical. They're right here at our doorsteps. And and you can really see that with the formation of ghost forests. And that's why it's so important, I think, to learn more about them um, and get everyone connected in documenting their formation. Hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Sarah, thank you again. We love chatting with you and thanks for all you do. Yeah, it was so nice meeting you both and thank you for having me on. So far, we've been talking mostly about the past. Historical records in Australia, the last cicada emergence, ghost forests. The final project we're highlighting is all about the future. Bringing people young and old into the climate change equation, encouraging them to share their perspectives and preparing them for the future. The project we're about to spotlight is part of an effort with 20 plus other science centers and museums across the USA, led by the Museum of Science Boston and supported by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA, and with a citizen science tie-in hosted on SciStarter.org forward slash NOAA, N-O-A-A. You'll find host states across the country featured on that page, and if you click the Louisville, Kentucky icon, it'll direct you to Ripple Effects. Led by a coalition of institutions in the Louisville area. Ripple Effects asks people of all ages to contribute their observations of climate, the environment, and weather to the global icy change platform. And one of the things that makes this project really special is that they combine the science of icy change with instruction in the art of photography and a special photo contest for young people. We'll let Dr. Perry Thomas and Akram Burton tell you about it. My name is Akram Burton, and I'm the executive director for the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage. Uh, We're an institution that preserves and promotes Kentucky African American heritage and the heritage that we share with the African diaspora. Currently involved in a a project called Ripple Effects, and it's our way of institutionally to contribute in addressing some of the issues of um, climate change and global warming. Great. And Perry, could you introduce yourself as well? Yes, I am an environmental scientist with the Kentucky Division of Water. My main role is as a river basin coordinator, serving a river basin that includes the city of Louisville and the city along the Ohio River, frequently flooded. Mm. And I've been especially impressed with Akram's abilities as a photographer and photojournalist. And he's attracted a number of other photojournalists in the region to join our Ripple Effects project and launch our photo contest and other initiatives. Oh, that's great. And what are the guidelines or the rules? What, what are they photographing? The focus was on water and, and we left it open in it. However, uh, Myself, along with photographer Marvin Young and some other photographers locally, did some tutorials uh, for students or uh, young people who maybe didn't have the background in photo composition and what have you. And again, it it, it was to, one, begin to develop uh, ways in which we could demonstrate the intersectionality between art, culture, and the environment. We really feel as though those are three things that I think we could be utilizing as citizens to really address the issue of climate change. Huh. Um, kind of pivot a little bit because um, I think the photo contest, that, like looking at your size starter page, it's such a such a beautiful portion. How would you say that relates to the work you all are doing with IC Change and with the rest of the, the NOAA project um, that, you, that you're a part of in terms of citizen science, civics, and resilience? Maybe, Perry, do you want to take that one? Sure. We're proud of our community, and uh, given the interest in not only the photo contest, but in using the skills that community members develop during the contest to capture additional images, especially images of rainfall, uh, extreme rain events that are coming more and more frequently and are becoming more intense in Kentucky. Uh, So citizens are capturing images of the effects of these events on their neighborhoods, using the photo skills they've developed and preparing to upload them to IC Change. 
And adding narratives, that's one of the ripple effects is that we're, we're now working on telling stories well with words as well as images. And we're looking forward to this all coming together as we bring people in for a, a resilience forum in September, uh, mm. planned by a researcher from the University of Louisville, who is an expert in participatory action research, Mary Breeden Miller. Great. So that's, I was just going to ask what's happening next. That sounds like that's what's happening uh, in the near future, right? Right. In addition to our appearance at the Kentucky State Fair, we have a, an exhibit called Ripple Effects that will be featured at the State Fair on Main Street. There's a section of the fair called Main Street. And we're bringing together a number of photographers, other artists, including a, a woman who creates mosaics uh, and a group from our Louisville Municipal Sewer District who are going to demonstrate how to create rain gardens, which are beautiful features for yards in Louisville to help stem the flow of rain from yards into the streets. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering too, because I know that, you know, you have your page up on SciStarter at the moment. Um, if I wanted to participate today um, in advance of the forum in September, what's the best way for me to do that? Well, anyone in Kentucky can participate. Uh, the, our particular project is focused in Louisville Metro. So that's people in Jefferson County. And they can go, just go to Sci Starter slash Ripple Effects and click on that IC Change link. And there are simple instructions for how to create an account in Sci Starter and then using the same email address, create an account in IC Change. And that's thanks to SciStarter for organizing those good instructions. Mm -hmm. Akram, if people are going to participate in IC Change today to get ready for the forum you both um, and your team are hosting in September, what's the number one tip you would give them for uh, creating a compelling photograph uh, that, you know, communicates something meaningful about climate change or the environment? Uh, when we talk about the arts and culture, we're talking about all aspects of the art. So uh, when we talk about a call to action, I I'm saying that it's not just limited to photography. Everyone is on deck here, all right? And everyone has a story to tell. Everyone can get involved in the various ways. And so by creating a platform where we look at it through the lens of culture, look at it through the lens of, of uh, arts, we expand the opportunities for getting more people involved, especially young people. Mm. I think to kind of close up, I wanted to ask you if there's anything else about ripple effects that you haven't said yet that you think listeners should know. And we kind of have a, a global listener base. So someone from India or like another country could be listening and maybe you inspire them to make their own version. So uh, any final thoughts for our, our global audience before we go? Well, Yes, your mention of a global audience reminds me of the importance of everyone's story. And I would encourage participants in this project to photograph what you know well. And that's what's going to be unique from you. Tell your story through the IC Change app, and we will look forward to seeing your images and how you describe them. Thank you. Great. So thanks, thanks for being with us. That's, that's fascinating. And uh, thanks for taking the time to explain ripple effects to us. You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Caroline. It's been a pleasure. Louisville Locals, the Ripple Effects team is gearing up for their NOAA forum. So don't hesitate to go to scistarter.org forward slash NOAA, N-O-A-A, to learn more. If you're in the USA, your science center or local museum may have a citizen science tie-in hosted there too. And for people everywhere, we encourage you to document what you see in your community with the Global IC Change Project. The six efforts we've highlighted here are just a taste of the many climate change and environmental citizen science projects available for you to discover on SciStarter. We hope you go to the Project Finder page, check them out, and share them with your friends. Because the best thing you can do to combat climate change is to get as many friends and relatives involved as you can to understand the problem. Citizen science may just be the perfect conversation starter. Thanks for listening. I'm Caroline Nickerson. And I'm Bob Hershon. See you next month. 
This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you'll find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.org. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier. And a huge thank you to you, the global citizen science community, for making this all possible.